Hello, everyone. Welcome to Science in the Age of COVID-19 seminar series, where we host experts from around the world to cover the latest on SARS-CoV-2. Our expert today is Dr. Robert Teachin, or Teach from UC Berkeley. Dr. Teachin is currently a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of California, Berkeley, and the former president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, HHMI. Dr. Tijin studies the biochemical aspects of gene regulation and over the years has made some fundamental contributions to the understanding of the process of eukaryotic transcription. Like many other labs, in the wake of the pandemic, Dr. Tijin and his group redirected part of their research efforts towards SARS-CoV-2 and devised an innovative new approach for virus testing that is inexpensive, fast and easy to adopt in a lab setting. We'll hear about that and much more in his talk, so stay tuned. And audience, uh, please, uh, a gentle reminder, at any time during the talk, you're more than welcome to post your questions in the Q&A box. At the end of the talk, we'll either call on you or we'll read out your questions for you. So thank you, Dr. Tijin. Uh, welcome, thanks for your time, and we look forward to your talk. Great. Sarana, thank you so much, and Lauren as well, uh, for uh, setting this thing up. I think it's uh, very, very useful. Um, I'm going to spend the next maybe 35 minutes or so telling you about some efforts that uh, students, postdocs, and undergrads in my lab have undertaken since March, uh, which seems like a long time ago already. Uh, and uh, I'll go through some of the quite amazing things that these uh, students and, and trainees have been doing in the lab, uh, largely motivated by their own interests. So um, let me go ahead and tell you that, uh, as Sarada just mentioned, you know, we're a gene regulation developmental biology lab working on, you know, stem cell gene expression. And uh, in March, actually before the, the order from the state to uh, shut down the lab, and shelter in place, we had already decided that we ought to start doing some work uh, in the virus, uh, partly because I was trained as a virologist. Some of you may, may or may not know that I, that I started my career uh, in studying uh, our, uh, DNA tumor virus. And so I thought it'd be interesting to go back to that. But really the truth of the matter is that, you know, we had no choice. The university pretty much mandated that none of us could work on our normal research anymore. Uh, and I also felt rather um, sensitive about the fact that I didn't want to impose on my students and associate graduates to come back into lab during that first uh, shelter in place. And so I pretty much left it to them uh, how they wanted to deal with their time. And many of them stepped up and said, no, we, we really wanna come in and work on campus, which you, you were allowed to do as long as you worked specifically on COVID-19 and uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so uh, that's how the next set of experiments I'm gonna tell you about came about. So I really wanna stress this point that I've been incredibly impressed and uh, gratified to see uh, students, postdocs, research associates, and even undergrads really step up entirely on their own. And each of the projects I'm going to tell you about this morning uh, were initiated by them uh, with literally no input from me uh, initially, uh, only encouragement and of course some funding. So here are the topics that uh, I'm gonna cover very briefly today. The, the first one uh, was uh, to establish actually a certified CLIA Center for testing uh, COVID-19 on the Berkeley campus. So I want to remind you that the Berkeley campus, like many of our associated campuses around the country, had no medical school. Uh, it does have a school of public health, but it has no medical center. And so we didn't actually have a CLIA site that was certified by the state and the federal government to allow us to do any testing. So uh, Jennifer Dowden and I, uh, who uh, help uh, each other run the uh, Innovative Genomics Institute decided that, of course, we could no longer work on CRISPR-Cas9 basic research, that we ought to uh, essentially switch that whole system to working on uh, COVID-19. Uh, the other topic I'm gonna tell you about is uh, 
as a result of our, our uh, work with IGI, we began to realize that there are issues with uh, PCR testing, particularly uh, supply chain issues, which I'll get back to a little bit later. And so several of the postdocs and grad students and, and, and uh, uh, research associates decided that they ought to come up with a more convenient, easily, easily distributed, cheaper uh, PCR testing uh, system. And I'll show you all of the features of that. And then a project that started a little bit later, uh, the idea of one entering graduate student, the first year graduate student, Oscar, who uh, decided that he really wanted to learn more about testing for the virus in wastewater, which I thought was just incredible. I knew nothing about it. Uh, it turns out we did have a faculty member in the School of Public Health who was quite expert at detecting infectious agents in, in the sewage. And so we began to work with, with her. The other thing that we knew that we would eventually need would be some uh, serological uh, assays to determine whether people actually had been exposed to uh, the virus or perhaps equally importantly, when we started to get vaccinated to, to actually ascertain that the vaccination worked on the individuals uh, that were vaccinated to test for uh, serologic uh, markers. And then finally, if I have time, I'll just say a few words about an amazing project that a grad student and an undergrad uh, spearheaded to, uh, to make hand sanitizers and PPE. Uh, you know, you remember how those things created major problems all over the country because of limitations. Uh, and so again, supply chain issues with, with both of those uh, important uh, reagents. So let me, let me get started. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this first topic, which was, how we stood up a UC Berkeley IGI high throughput SARS PCR testing center. Uh, Jennifer Doudna, who uh, is, the, is the director of the IGI and I and a number of other leaders on the campus realized that we could not uh, rely on our local community uh, health, uh, public health system to cover all of the testing that we imagined we would need. This was in very early uh, March, in fact, just at the very beginning of March. And so uh, we had just received a significant amount of funding for the IGI to set up a, a bunch of uh, robotic systems intended for completely different purpose, but we decided that we should basically repurpose that uh, facility, both space and equipment, uh, to try to see if we could set up a high throughput a SARS-CoV-2 diagnostic uh, testing center. That took a huge amount of both uh, scientific will and political will to do that. I had to go to the chancellor and to the president of the university to eventually get the state to give us a CLIA certification uh, through some very complicated mechanisms, which I don't want to go into here. Uh, many of my colleagues all over the country would call us up and say, how the heck did you guys do it? You have no medical school. And so we actually wrote up a paper to describe how we essentially put up uh, you know, uh, this, this uh, system very, very quickly. It was, I think, less than three weeks from conception to uh, taking the first samples. We very quickly ran into the supply chain problems. Because by the time we were getting into this, it was clear that remarkably, who would ever have imagined that, you know, one of the major centers for uh, producing swabs was in Northern Italy, and Italy had just been hit. Uh, very severely with, uh, with COVID-19. And so we had to think of other places to get the nasal swabs as well as the transfer buffers. I know this sounds absolutely trivial, but it turns out to be a huge problem when you need you know, hundreds of thousands of these reagents. So we went uh, very quickly to taking nasal swabs. In those days, we were still limited to doing nasal pharyngeal swabs, which is quite unpleasant. Uh, today, we don't do that anymore. Uh, and very quickly, you know, we realized there was a dire need uh, all around us in our communities, uh, the Berkeley community itself, uh, first responders, uh, firemen, policemen, uh, prison guards, and then of course the prisons themselves. So we, we managed to get up to about uh, a um, high throughput of about 500 assays a day. We were still doing single assays per, per reaction in those days. Uh, and then we overcame all kinds of technical problems, uh, which we can someday talk about 
you know, actually a nasopharyngeal sample can be very viscous and creates all kinds of problems for detection. Uh, and then we knew that we were going to be up against a huge uh, wave when the students were going to be coming back uh, in the fall. And so we developed what we call the IGI FAST test, which is uh, uh, basically a saliva-based test for asymptomatic populations. Uh, and then we continue to use the nasal pharyngeal for the symptomatic ones. We also, of course, had to raise a significant amount of money from private sources uh, we, if there were no, nothing else that could support this. Uh, and so Jennifer did an amazing job of getting donors to, to step up and give us actually tens of millions of dollars to do the scale up. Uh, so those of you who are interested in, you know, just the raw reagents that you buy or receive from, you know, any, any source uh, costs roughly about 30 to $45 per assay. That's not counting the labor and the robotics and everything else. So just the plastics and, and uh, you know, magnetic beads or whatever it is that you're using to isolate the RNA. So it is not an inexpensive test. And as those of you who have actually gotten the test outside know, it, it'll it probably cost you about $150 to $200 to do a single test. The other thing that we were really uh, interested in doing is to have the so-called turnaround time, the, the time from the sample to the to the result to be you know somewhere between 24 and 48 hours i think we've all realized and are still realizing that that is a key parameter and you know if we have a seven day turnaround time it's useless for contact tracing or for anything else uh and then of course eventually we got more sophisticated and now we do pooled sampling so we can actually mix four patient samples and do one assay it saves a huge amount of time and money. Uh, this only works, of course, if your inherent uh, positive rate is fairly low, which, thank goodness, for the last you know eight months, uh, all in our area, it's it, it's quite low, as you can see, probably less than one percent uh, of tested samples. We're now ramped up to about uh, at least two thousand samples a day now that we're pooling. Uh, and we're still using a combination of, uh, of nasal pharyngeal as well as uh, other types of swabs. And so uh, we expect we're going to really need to ramp this up over the next three months. I think it's going to be critical the next three months. So it's been an interesting thing to set up a, a completely uh, clinical center in, in a non-medical uh, school setting, and it's been quite a interesting lesson uh, that, that I've had, uh, that Jennifer and I have experienced. So that's all I'm going to say for, for, for this part of it. Uh, if there are questions later, I'm happy to answer. So I'm going to move on <clears throat> to the next topic, which I already kind of uh, anticipated a little bit for you, which is very quickly when we started the high throughput screening, we realized that it wasn't just the test tube or the, or the swabs that were becoming uh, limiting, but that quite possibly the reagents uh, that we use for doing the PCR, you know, who would have imagined we'd be running out of you know, reverse transcriptase or TAC polymerase, not to mention the fact that you know, they're very, very expensive. And sure enough, if we hadn't ordered massive amounts early on, we would have run into a supply chain issue. So uh, just about the time that we started to put the CLIA center up, uh, one of the postdocs in my lab uh, Thomas Graham, who actually was part of the CLIA Center, realized that they were going to be running into potential uh, supply chain issues, started working in our own lab here uh, in, 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 the, uh, in our building. So that IGI is in the IGI building. Uh, we started doing this in the Li Keqing building uh, as part of our sort of more support system, which, which is to try to develop cheaper, uh, not supply chain limited. And so, uh, so what was the rationale here? So the, the rationale was simple. We don't want to run into a supply chain bottleneck for testing ourselves or anybody else. Uh, we wanted to set something up that would be open source immediately so that anybody uh, out there in the world who needed it could use it. Uh, and we were particularly interested, and I should say Thomas was particularly interested in doing this in a way so that it would be cheap enough that even you know, developing countries, which we knew were going to get hit, 
sooner or later. At that time, you know, Africa hadn't been hit very hard yet, but we knew it was coming. So that, uh, you know, Asian countries, South America and, uh, and Africa would, would still be able to afford something less than, you know, $200 uh, an asset. One step that we immediately realized when we stood up the IGI center was that, you know, if you have to isolate the RNA from the virus, uh, that's a really uh, expensive and time consuming step. And in fact, it required us to use two sets of different robots to do uh, extraction and then followed by a robotic step to do the assay. And so we thought, well, it'd be really great if we could just get rid of the RNA extraction step. So that's, so those were two of the key things set up reagents that were no longer limited and uh, get rid of the RNA extraction and purification step. Uh, we thought this would be particularly important when we go to large scale asymptomatic screening. Now, let me remind you that back then in April, we weren't even allowed to do asymptomatic screening. We were only allowed to do it through the clinics for symptomatic screens. Uh, that's what the CDC was recommending at the time. You know. Fortunately, that's changed now, but we probably should have been doing much higher rates of asymptomatic screening much, much earlier. Um, and then ultimately, we, we also thought that if we could make things cheap enough, we could not only do individual surveillance, but we could do community surveillance. And as I said, I'll tell you a little bit more about this amazing stuff with wastewater detection. So that's what Thomas set out to do with Gina Daly uh, and Claire Darzak in the lab. This is just a quick slide to remind you what the PCR assay is. It's a fluorogenic assay. It's very simple. When, when you do the primer extension and out, uh, the, the uh, PCR reaction, uh, you displace this uh, self-quenched uh, TAC probe, which uh, we can either use our own or we can use uh, the TAC man, which is expensive. Uh, and then it'll uh, unquench and we can detect. And so the lower the CT value, the more RNA you're detecting. But this does require you to extract the RNA from the virus. Remember, the virus is encapsulated uh, in a protein coat. You've got to uncoat that and you've got to do that without destroying the RNA, et cetera, et cetera, before you actually do the uh, cDNA uh, analysis. So that's what your typical RT-PCR looks like. Um, and so what Thomas did, and it took quite a lot of time to get all the reagents so that we could purify our own enzymes this is very important uh, and all make all of our own reagents so that very very little other than the oligonucleotides was being bought and so thomas called this the basic economical amplification reaction mix or bear mix for obviously for the berkeley bears uh, we made our own uh, mlv reverse transcriptase which was no longer under patent so that the, you know people couldn't come after you for using it Really, we could make, you know, in uh, 10 liters of bacteria, we could make, you know, a million assays worth of uh, reverse transcriptase. Same thing for TAC polymerase. These are two enzymes that are extremely easy to make in large scale, which my lab could do in fermenters. Uh, you can see that one liter of bacteria gives you 50,000 reactions. So we lowered the cost almost 100 fold. I think it is close to 100 fold uh, at this point because we kept shaving down the cost. I think at this point, the most costly part of the reaction is the plastic tube that you collect the nasal pharyngeal uh, samples. This is just a little bit of raw data to show you that the, the acid is very uh, sensitive. Uh, we're detecting somewhere between 10 and probably 30 uh, RNAs per sample. Uh, this is using the standard primers that have, were approved by the CDC. Here is a nice example of some real uh, samples from uh, hospitals nearby, uh, Altabates and various other hospitals. One of the amazing things about our experience was that the science was easy. The hardest thing was to actually get patient samples from Kaiser Permanente or you know Altabates or UCSF because there are all kinds of rules about how you share a sam a patient samples, human patient samples, and because. Uh, until we were uh, a CLIA center, uh, you couldn't do that. And of course, it's a catch-22. You can't become a CLIA center without getting these samples. So I had to do a lot of uh, running around to try to get that. Eventually, it all worked. You can see that our assays are 
almost as good as the very, very best sensitive assays, which the IGI was uh, using and paying about $45 an assay for, and ours is probably less than a dollar. Uh, the other thing we realize is that, you know, if you don't have a nice, fancy QPCR machine, you're, you're not going to get those nice curves, CP curves, but really in a third world country, you're not likely to have those machines. So we wanted to have an alternative way for you to at least have, see a plus minus signal uh, when you do this uh, PCR assay. And here's a nice fluorescence imaging assay that you can do in a couple of different modes, as long as you have a you know, a UV box, uh, you can detect it. So that, that was really, really useful, using exactly the same reagents as you would for the QPCR. So now comes the more tricky part, which is can we get rid of the RNA extraction step? Uh, and uh, maybe it'll come out in the questions, but it's like, why is that so complicated? Well, it's because of the way you have to collect the sample and, and uh, what the sample, what that swab sits into in, in so-called the transfer buffer, because you got to transfer it from wherever the patient got the sample taken to the laboratory. And that's actually could take a day sometimes. Uh, and as you know, many of you probably have experienced situations where if you went and took, took the, the tests from LabCorp or Quest, it could take six or seven days. And so we had to make sure because because this is an RNA virus and RNA is extremely labile. Once you uncoat it from the protein coat, uh, how to do this in a way that would not compromise the integrity of the RNA, so that your sensitivity didn't go down, but at the same time, uh, you didn't put in nasty reagents which would kill your RNA, uh, your uh, reverse transcriptase and your TAC polymerase. So that that was the problem, and eventually. Uh, Thomas figured it out, uh, and again, I'm not going into the details. This is actually now uh, uh, up in, uh, will be published, but it's already in uh, Met Archives. So if you want to look at the details, how we got around those problems, you can look at that. But here's the point is that we eventually, after about four months of hard work on the part of the, the team, they, they, they came up with a procedure that really solved a lot of the issues of how you keep the sample safe uh, from being degraded, but at the same time, no longer infectious. Uh, and so with this somewhat less uh, sensitive, and it is less sensitive, but probably one, uh, two CT values, uh, we could again show that uh, it, it's actually very, very, very good, uh, probably as good as most assays that are out there and probably better than, than many that are out there. But the important thing is it is extremely fast because you completely skip the, the RNA extraction step, which is probably the longest part of the reaction. It's way, way cheaper. And of course, it's easier if you, if you don't have fancy robots. And uh, so far, you know, it's been uh, tested and in, in, is being used in a lot of places. We can't even keep track of all the places that it's been used. Uh, we've made sort of large amounts of sort of uh, uh, test kits for people to, to uh, test for themselves. We've sent it all over the world. So people have something to measure themselves against before they make their own reagents. This does require that they, you know, purify the enzymes, and make 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 the buffers, and so forth. Uh, this can be used for, uh, of course, for swabs, uh, and most importantly, without RNA purification. We haven't fully shown that it works quite as well with saliva, although in the laboratory it does work pretty well with saliva. Uh, and if people are interested in why is saliva so complicated, it, it is very complicated. Um, the level of detection, as I said, is somewhere between 10 and 30 viral messenger RNA, uh, viral RNAs. Um, and it is, of course, almost 100 fold less uh, expensive. And uh, we hope that, you know, more and more people will be using this. Uh, we hope that they let us know that they are using it. So that, that's out the door and the publication is on, on the way. So now I'm going to go to the third topic, which for my own purposes is probably one of the most intriguing. Uh, I hadn't really thought about, you know, that you could test, do surveillance testing uh, community-wide. So up to that point, we had mainly been doing surveillance testing, in, you know, in the Oakland uh, region, the Richmond region, San Francisco, Berkeley, Albany, and so forth, just by individual tests which is extremely expensive, although, you know, obviously quite accurate. 
And then there were a couple of papers that came out suggesting that, you know, in the infectious diseases world, people have been doing wastewater testing of all kinds of infectious agents for, for decades. Uh, and so uh, one of my graduate students who had just entered the lab, Oscar Whitney, decided that he'd look into this. Um, and very quickly he realized that there were some serious, um, let's say inefficiencies in the processes that are uh, generally used for such wastewater detection. So one of the things that he immediately figured out was that most wastewater detection protocols are designed for you to isolate the intact infectious agent, whether it's a bacteria or a virus, not the nucleic acid, uh, you know, chromosome. And so he realized that very quickly that, you know, you could do this, but the technology wasn't actually there. You could think it through. And what he realized was the sensitivity, especially for a very labile uh, genome, such as the RNA of Co SARS-CoV-2 was, was, was really terrible. And so he decided he needed to develop something new so that it could be used to monitor communities at a fairly sensitive level. And you remember, we were still getting, you know, less than a few percent positives out there. So, you know, it was, the detection had to be sensitive and he had to develop something that, again, would be cheap and efficient for extracting the RNA in a way that would be protected in the wastewater. And yet, you know, you can't be slopping the stuff around and, and have infectious agents. Uh, and then really apply it to the Bay Area. And here we were really helped by a relationship we had with uh, what's called East Bay Mud or the, you know, the uh, community uh, wastewater treatment center, municipal uh, district of the East Bay. And so we uh, forged a relationship with them, as well as a really great relationship with Kara Nelson, who's a professor in the School of Public Health that is an expert on uh, wastewater uh, infectious, infectious agent detection. So we, our teams got together and then, but Oscar really drove the uh, molecular vial. And uh, again, I'm gonna cut to the chase here for time, but it was amazing what, I, what, what Oscar was able to do. He very quickly showed that you could uh, preserve the RNA by throwing in a, a large amount of salt, uh, lyse the organism, and then heat and activate everything so that the uh, no infectious agent, no matter what the infectious agent was, was, was uh, inactivated. And then filter it through uh, silica, basically ground up sand, uh, and then uh, lower the salt, extract it, and do the PCR reaction. It was brilliant. It took him only about a month to figure this out. And he basically increased the sensitivity by about 20 or 30 fold. I'm gonna show you a, a few examples here. Uh, you know, if you do the ultra filtration in the old way versus the, the so-called 4S method uh, that he developed with or without heat and activation, you can see that uh, you get much, much higher sensitivity. But even more importantly, he was one of the few people to realize that, you know, to really do proper analysis of surveillance, you, you actually have to know when you're collecting this, the, the wastewater sample, you know, what is the number of, of people that's contributing to it. So you have to have an independent way to normalize for the, for the uh, virus versus people load of RNA. And he figured out two ways to do that. One is human 18S RNA detection. And the other one was using this crazy virus called pepper mild model virus, which is, comes in pepper. And I guess humans eat it, not, nobody else eats it. And so it's a good way to detect, you know, what the, the fecal load of, of the sample you're looking at is from humans. So using either of one of these two, he can normalize what the viral uh, detection of SARS-CoV-2 is. Here's the regions that we were looking at. You can see some samples of the different uh, sewer sheds I never thought I'd even say the word sewer sheds, never heard of it before, uh, three different districts, and the importance of actually having the normalized uh, either with the 18S or the uh, PMMV, uh, showing you uh, much more reliable data. Uh, here's some really interesting data you can imagine. If you've been reading in the news how you know the, the, the virus load is very, very unevenly distributed depending on you know, where you live, uh, what kind of work you do, you see the UC Berkeley campus and the Berkeley Hills, East Bay Hills, very, very low. North Berkeley, El Cerrito, equally low. Oakland, it starts going up. Then San Quentin went crazy. We've never seen anything like it. 
uh, anything that's in the same effluent flow as San Quentin, we see very, very high. That's why San Rafael was so high. So we started to see that there was a very nice reflection of the actual virus uh, cases detected by classic individual PCR assays versus uh, wastewater. Here's a, uh, an example of uh, looking across time and how important it is to have the internal control. You can see that using the internal control shown on the bottom with the PMMB, uh, you get much, much better, uh, more reliable results. And I'll show you a little bit more on that. So that was an important control. Here was a really cool thing that happened. Well, cool in the sense that it said uh, how reliable our assay was. So one of the, you see in, uh, in June, uh, there was a spike in the East Bay, which didn't make sense because, you know, everything where else it was going down. Uh, so that was in, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the situation where, uh, they were looking at individuals. Uh, and so we were wondering what, what, what is the spike? And it turns out that the spike, when we went back and looked at, at our data more carefully, uh, that spike was not real. It turns out that it was a, uh, over uh, um, reporting of the sample. And so we, we were actually correct and their analysis was incorrect. And this, this is the normalized uh, information once we figured that out. So it turns out that you know, that was just human error. They, they put into the computer the same data twice, which is what allowed them to see the spike. Turns out there really wasn't a spike and our data actually suggested to them they should go back and look at that. But I thought that was actually very interesting. The other thing that was really cool was that we were uh, monitoring the, the outflow of just one uh, living unit, the University Village, which has about uh, 2,700 residents. And uh, it was flat, flat, flat. And then all of a sudden, uh, you see here, there was a spike. And we traced that to just two people out of 2,700 residents. So that gave us a sense of what the sensitivity was likely to be. Uh, which was obviously very important uh, on, a, on a campus with resident halls and so forth. So that, that was very encouraging. So that, that's ongoing. Uh, we're doing testing uh, all over the Bay Area still. Uh, I think they're still only testing once a week. They may have to ramp that up to testing every couple of days. I think it's going to get really bad in the next three months. Uh, and I don't know if in the communities around where you guys live, uh, they're doing any wastewater testing. Uh, if they're not, uh, it probably is not a bad idea. Uh, the next thing I want to quickly cover uh, is our very uh, quick uh, and efficient uh, putting up a serologic test. You know, so serologic test, all of you know, is is not really particularly good for for detecting uh, you know live infectious periods, but it's good to know whether you've ever been infected. You know, because so much of this virus is, uh, damage is done with people that are uh, asymptomatic, it would actually be nice to know, for, for example, uh, with, whether anybody ever did get infected, even though they showed no symptoms. So that was one of the things that we wanted to do. Uh, the other thing, of course, is as we get into this situation over the next six to eight months of people getting vaccinated, it would be nice to be able to test yourself and make sure that you are actually raising antibodies uh, and, and other uh, immune reactions against your vaccine. And so for those two reasons, we decided to test it out. Also, you may remember early on in this business, uh, people were a little uh, skeptical about the quality and sensitivity of the uh, serologic test. And that's because they were using really crappy antigens to do the tests early in the early days because they were trying to make money on the tests. Uh, we followed the, the, the lead from, uh, uh, published results which suggested that certain antigens were much more reliable than others. And so uh, Megan Espen in the lab graduate student decided to take this on all by herself. So uh, we were hoping to develop uh, not only just a straightforward sensitive serologic test, but one that we could do using finger prick blood draw rather than, uh, you know, intravenous blood draw. Because obviously we're not a clinical center. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, a finger prick, you can do it in the lab. And so the idea here is to try to go and find what antigen uh, is being made by the virus, the most sensitive for, for detecting uh, uh, antibodies uh, in, in your bloodstream. 
uh, if you've been exposed uh, to the virus. Uh, and so we wanted a system that was quick, quantitative, and sensitive. Um, and the idea is very simple. You, again, because we're protein biochemists, we didn't have much trouble purifying, expressing and purifying basically any antigen that this virus uh, is making. We purified two different proteins. One was called the RBD, which is the receptor binding domain, which is what a lot of assays uh, use out there in the, in the uh, public domain. Uh, we also use the spike protein, which is a full length spike protein for coronavirus. Uh, that's much harder to purify, but the protein is, uh, gives you a much more sensitive assay by about a factor of three or so. And so we, we tested both of them out. Uh, we also did our tests in a much better way. We don't just do a plus minus type of assay. We do a, a, a dilution series and it gives you a nice uh, concentration curve. Again, it's a, it's a, it's a simple uh, colorimetric test. Uh, here's what theoretically it looks like. You do a serial dilution. You have a bunch of negative controls. Again, we needed to get sera from patients to validate the assay. Uh, it took me quite a while to finally get patients to, uh, to send me their samples uh, or I mean the hospitals. And so eventually Megan was able to show uh, a very, very sensitive assay here uh, where we could dilute down to very, very low concentrations. Uh, here's a, a reciprocal dilution uh, plot you can see. Uh, and so you, first thing you notice is that patients come uh, with very, you know, orders of magnitude difference in their uh, sera uh, concentrations, which is very, very interesting. And then in a couple of cases, we followed, uh, we were able to get sera from these same patients, you know, months later to see how, how stable they were. And I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, the other thing was we wanted to uh, compare the finger prick with the uh, you know, blood draw, which we didn't want to do blood draws. And the finger prick is uh, almost exactly as sensitive. So if we look at different uh, patients with different levels of sera, we picked up all, of, all the ones that are positive and, and found the negative ones to be negative. So that was really great. Uh, in, in looking at the longevity of the sera, we we had a number of patients we looked at uh, who were willing to give us uh, samples, you know, over time. And it looked like in most samples, um, and we didn't do very many, uh, they lasted, you know, many, many months. Uh, but there was clearly a drop off after about the first three months, quite significant drop off. And then it would plateau and stay, stay constant for a very, very long time. I think the longest one we tested out was about eight months. So the conclusions here are is that the purified spike protein is more sensitive and that's what we would use. The ELISA test uh, works great, both with finger pricks and with the normal blood draw. Uh, I think the antibody levels are actually quite stable for long periods of time. This is really good news for the uh, vaccination protocols that are coming in. Great to hear that you know AstraZeneca's antibodies, if you give it, uh, two shots is probably going to be better than 90%, just like, like the Moderna uh, and the Pfizer ones. And I think most people are going to have, you know, pretty good levels of uh, protection for, I'm guessing, you know, between a, a year or so. Uh, and so I think things are looking up, but it's going to be probably another six to eight months before most of the population gets vaccinated. And the last thing I just want to say very, very quickly, since I've pretty much run out of time that I want to talk is that uh, quite inspirational work by a grad student, Abrar Abidi and Yvonne Howe, an undergrad. Uh, very early on, they realized that the underserved communities in East Oakland, uh, the Mission District and Richmond uh, were having difficulties getting uh, hand sanitizers and PPE. They also got a, a request from uh, the four corners of, in the southwest of the uh, reservation, Navajo reservation, which was in dire need of, of uh, uh, particularly of hand sanitizers since they are very limited in water supplies. And so Abrara and Yvonne just spearheaded this uh, amazing production of, you know, uh, CDC and WHO approved, very effective hand lotion, sanitizing lotion. And you can see that they eventually got 11 research labs on the Berkeley campus to participate with grad students and postdocs. They have over 100 active volunteers around the Bay Area to distribute these things. 
uh, here Yvonne and Abra are standing in front of a couple of, uh, I think it was a hundred gallons that they sent, or maybe more than a hundred gallons that they sent to, uh, to the Navajo reservation. They've partnered with many, many organizations to distribute it. Uh, now I think they're into over 5,000 gallons uh, of the sanitizer, uh, probably 10,000 reusable face masks. I made the slide some time ago. They've made lots of disinfectant wipes and so on and so forth. And we got some funding from the uh, Cheryl and Kersey Foundation to, uh, to do this work. Uh, and here's just uh, all the places that they've been uh, taking this to. Uh, it's, it's now in the Bay Area, the stuff is called liquid gold uh, for all the uh, people who need it. And uh, they, they have not been able to stop making it even though we are no longer in lockdown and Abrar is back doing his normal research on gene expression, but uh, he keeps the operation going uh, and he's still providing hundreds of gallons uh, a week. Uh, with that, I'm gonna stop. Here are the pictures of these amazing people who basically just volunteered their time. So that's Tom Graham, Thomas Graham uh, up at the top with Gina Daly and, and, and uh, Claire Darzac who did the uh, bear mix. Uh, and then we have Oscar Whitney who did the uh, uh, wastewater treatment uh, analysis and Megan Espin who did the, the uh, antibodies and all the other people that helped in all of these different projects. And of course, Abrar and Yvonne who did the hand sanitizer. And with that, I'm really happy to take questions. Deej, that was amazing. It, all the stuff that you guys managed to accomplish and all the, the good, like both scientifically and just in terms of good works. That's, uh, that's extremely inspiring. Um, so while we're waiting for questions to come in, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the resource poor um, countries and other sites that are trying to adopt your uh, PCR test? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just tell you one example. So uh, I think it was Indonesia. Uh, the, the minister of Indonesia contacted us some time ago. They had Somebody had read our paper or something online. And they said, you know, we really want to do it. So we sent them a, a, a sort of a, a starter kit and they, they started testing it. And they, they came back and said, okay, we're, we're going to tool this up. Okay, so now this is really interesting. <laughs> so we said, great. And they said, can you send us some more stuff, you know, to, to, to kind of help us get it into, because, you know, this is a huge population they got to work with. Well, it turns out that in Indonesia, most of the test is done by the military. Okay, so fine. And then I realized, wait a minute, I, I can't send anything to the military of another <laughs> country <laughs> without, without getting approval. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure, you know, then I had to tell the, the legal team at Berkeley and HHMI that this was being done. And, you know, you can imagine, wait, wait a minute, well, you can't send anything to the military of Indonesia. <laughs> so I think they're, got, they're, they're moving ahead and we, we couldn't send them any more reagents. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Um, so, yeah, I w on a related note, I want to ask you more about um, Bermex. Um, I mean, can you guys really scale this up? I mean, because I imagine, I mean, we all know that this winter is going to be gruesome. Um, it, like, are there supply chain um, uh, hangups again on uh, reagents? And could this help? I mean, even if there aren't, like a, th a hundredfold cheaper, yeah, it's going to change the game. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, so... We came really close to actually doing that for you, for California. Hmm. Uh, the California, the, the governor's office really looked into our stuff uh, at length. Uh, but I think in the background, they were also doing a deal with uh, a hmm. company uh, in Massachusetts to, to do a faster test. So our test is still not fast. Okay. So I think in the end, they decided to go with that. So we almost... You know, you could say we almost swung a, you know, billion dollar deal with the state of California <laughs> to do this. Um, but to answer your question, you know, some of the reagents are really easy to, to, to make now that we have a procedure. So the key thing is the, the buffer that you collect the sample in. Okay. Yeah. 
that's actually quite expensive because you know they use some very you know complicated reagents to, 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 to preserve the RNA. Mm -hmm. But the trouble is if you preserve the RNA that way, you can't do a direct RNA test. You have to then extract. Mm -hmm. And so we came up with a super simple mess, uh, method, which is, believe it or not, is just distilled deionized water with proteinase K. Mm -hmm. And then you just heat and activate that after you've killed everything. Mm -hmm. And now you haven't put anything nasty in there like, you know, reagents that would normally kill RNAs because we will have killed all the RNAs with proteinase K. And that, that's, that was the trick. It took us quite a while to get to that. It's an old, old procedure. That's why I say it's retro because we, we yeah. went way back to the 80s to figure out what, what, what's a good you know, procedure to, to deal with. So heat and activation and protein is paid. Turns out yeah, I mean, that's gotta be really cheap too. I mean, exactly, exactly. Yeah. You just cut out a, like three quarters of the price. Yeah, uh, because I, you know, a lot of people are using RNA shield, which is great, but that's exactly. four bucks. No, no, that's four RNA bucks a sample. So you know what's in RNA shield, right? It's the nastiest thing. Yeah, we used it. In fact, we tried to we tried to deconstruct what's in RNA shield. Yeah. Uh, we, we we probably know what's in it, but you know, exact ratios and stuff. It's hard. To, this is the trouble with reagents; they never tell you what the hell is in them. I mean, when you buy these reagents, they don't tell you. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. We've got um, our first audience question. Uh, it's anonymous, so we can't um, uh, enable them to ask it. So I'll ask it. Um, okay. A basic question. If someone has a positive antibody test, how do we know that that indicates the person had SARS-CoV-2 versus infection with another coronavirus? Yeah. So that's really good question. Um, the uh, the assays that we developed were based on Orian Kramer's work on mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2, and he went out of his way to make sure that the antigens he was using could discriminate between SARS-CoV-2 and other SARS-related viruses. Mm -hmm. So in our assay, I would say we're pretty sure. However, yeah. there are many, many serologic assays out there that probably are not using the full length spike protein with you know, the appropriate modifications in the amino acids to make sure that you can discriminate. So, so it, it again, depends on the assay. And a lot of times when you do a test, they don't even tell you which antigen they're using. So it's, it's, it's yeah, it, it could be a problem. Yeah. Uh, we've got our next audience question. Um, Sarada, can you turn on Tim Harris? Yes. Uh, Tim, uh, would you please ask your question? Unmute yourself, Tim. Now I have an okay. There we go. Yeah, I um, can hear you. So, Tej, um, you know, that, that um, spectacular capability, but from the standpoint of someone who doesn't do molecular biology, it sounds like growing bacteria and isolating a reverse transcriptase is still really hard. It's, do you expect third world people to learn how to do that? It just, is it just not hard as us novices think it is? Yeah, it's pretty easy because these are all tagged molecules and purifying tacrolimerase is like falling off a log. <laughs> you, you make the extract and you boil it and spin it out. So yeah, no, it's, 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 it's literally like a one-step purification. And how about um, the MLV purification? Is that similarly easy? That's a tag, yeah, that's a tag version. Oh, okay. So one, one quick follow-up is that on, on the subject of, of antibody testing is, is that there were lots of early reports that the infection count was, you know, 20 or 50 times what was being reported based on these serological tests, do you have an opinion as to whether or not those were being conducted with an appropriate level of selectivity or, or not? Early on, Tim, they definitely were not. It was very clear that the first set of uh, serologic tests were using really crappy antigens. The, these were tests that came out of uh, Asia, I believe, originally probably from China, and they were not, they were not using the 4N Kramer highly uh, controlled antigens. Uh, and so, yeah, there were probably lots of uh, 
both false positives and false negatives. So I, I, I would say just, you know, I think the numbers uh, of, you know, what percentage of the population is, is really positive is pretty reliable now with the serologic test, but it's still better to look at the numbers from the PCR test. Thanks. So um, Tej, I wondered, you mentioned saliva. Um, can, can you say more? I mean, are, are you guys gonna migrate to saliva? I mean, you get much better compliance with saliva than NP. Yeah, so let me <laughs> tell you, yeah. Let me tell you what we migrated to. So we kind of went back and forth. So. So when we, when Jennifer and I realized that there was going to be, you know, 10,000 students coming back to the campus to, at some level or another, you know, with up to 2,500 to 3,000 living in dorms, uh, we thought, holy smokes, this is, you know, trying to get them to do a nasopharyngeal is not going to work. <laughs> so, so we stood up two sets of uh, what we call COVID testing tents. So it's collection centers, and we went to the saliva test there. Mm -hmm. And uh, this works fine for, you know, high volume, somewhat lower sensitivity tests. But, you know, the thing is, saliva is really complex. Mm -hmm. And different people, saliva composition is yep. very different. I'll give you a fantastic example. One of my colleagues never got a saliva test to work. He tried like eight different times. There's something in his saliva that just prevents the test from giving reliable results. And so you pretty much have to like eliminate those and tell the patient, hey, look, your saliva just never scores properly. The, 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 the baseline is crazy. The background doesn't make sense. There's something in there that's just like killing the acid. So saliva is complicated. Uh, that said, we screened thousands, tens of thousands of students that way. Uh, and you know, the, again, the infection rate was very low, but the trick there was that if we got any positives at all, they had to go do a nasal pharynx. Oh, sure. So, um, but then what we decided was that we had enough experience with the saliva and with the nasal pharyngeal and neither one was ideal yeah because what you really see the nasal pharyngeal for people who don't understand this you you have to go in there and there's a guy dressed in full ppe giving you the nasal pharyngeal test and then when the, before the next patient comes he has to like completely derobe and start over again so he's wasting ppe like crazy okay mm -hmm. So it's not just that he's throwing away the nasal, the, 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 the swab, he's, he's got to completely change. Mm. So it would be much better if it was self-administered. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing now is we're not doing saliva, but we're doing self-administered nasal swabs, but they're probably not nasal pharyngeal because no person wants to stick it all the way up into the nasal pharyngeal spot. Yeah. But they're ju almost just as reliable. So okay. we don't see that as a as an issue. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know it's like. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's just so complicated landscape. Like some people test positive in saliva, but not with NP. Um, yeah. The yeah. biodistribution of this virus is very odd. It is. Um, it is. <laughs> um, yeah. Serata has one now. All right. Thank you, Teach. Um, so. Switching gears, my question to you is about the viral genome sequencing from wastewater. Um, so I would imagine you would need a complete viral genome to perform lineage tracing and the downstream epidemiology to perform, to track the you know, pathogen evolution and dynamics. So my question to you is how complete, do you, do you recover complete genomes from wastewater? Yeah, you know, Sarada, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that uh, because I think that work is ongoing. That is what uh, um, Kara Nelson's team is doing. I believe they are getting, uh, you know, it's going to be fragmented, mm -hmm. but they should still get, if the samples are big enough, uh, they, they'll still get full length because, you know, it's a, not a very large RNA virus. But yes, the, the RNA is very likely going to be fragmented. 
it is actually a pretty big virus. Well, I mean, <laughs> compared to other things that we could be looking at, it is a pretty big, yeah, as an RNA virus shows. Yes. Yeah. I guess, but <laughs> that's right. That's right. Great. And as a follow up question, uh, I mean, I understand this is an ongoing work, but have you spotted, uh, have you identified variants, uh, genomic variants? Uh, and if so, how well do they correlate with, uh, you know, the dynamics that you've noticed with clinical samples? You know, I think that work is probably further along uh, over in UCSF because I believe the Biohub has been doing a pretty extensive genome sequencing. Uh, not from wastewater, but from from individual samples. And they've collected, you know, thousands of samples. So I, I believe that they're doing much better tracing uh, of, of, you know, evolutionary uh, changes and, uh, you know, whatever uh, changes in the uh, sequences that are happening. And I, I have not been following that. I have to admit. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody uh -huh. else knows more about that, but I, 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 I don't. Yeah, and Tej, we had a um, an audience question similar to that. Um, can you tell us a bit about the mechanics of the, the logistics of the wastewater testing? Like, do they do the extraction over there, or do they mail you some poop? Or what? Yeah, no, no, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, they don't mail me the poop. No. Uh, <laughs> what happens is actually it's interesting. So. We, we had to work it out because we, we did not want to have some sample come out of East Bay Mud's laboratory that was still infectious. Yeah. And I don't just mean infectious for COVID-19. I mean, right. it, who the heck knows is this, okay? <laughs> so this is why we, we actually ordered a, you know, a very sophisticated water bath system and mm -hmm. we installed it over in their laboratory. So mm -hmm. after the by the way, the sample is is pretty well filtered. If, if I showed you the sample, it doesn't look like poop in your normal way. It's it's pretty well treated. It's treated wastewater. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, so it's it, it, it's still pretty nasty, uh, and so it gets it, we 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 deactivate it there, mm. but but we use our you know we give them our our sample materials to deactivate. And so we know we, we don't bring any of that stuff into our own laboratory, but we're the ones who are then putting it through the silica and doing all that. Yeah. yeah. Huh, I wonder if the, does the, do you know if the wastewater treatment, um, you know, does that fragment the, the RNA genome? It's I, I'm sure it does. I'm sure at some level it does, um, which is probably why most of the, uh, you know, normal procedures we're trying to purify the virus particles rather than the RNA. Yeah. It has its own problems. For this particular virus, it looks like RNA detection was much better. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, def definitely more than I thought I thought I would ever learn about that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, the joke, the joke in the lab is that, you know, my lab is finally working on shit science. <laughs> Um, so just yeah, one question, Tej. Uh, sorry, Lauren, do you have one? No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. So when you do metagenomics, uh, I'm sure you also, you basically sequence the whole whole genome, uh, sequence whatever is there in the wastewater. So I would imagine you would also see probably some patterns of some co-infection with other viruses. Yeah. So mm -hmm. my question to you is, can any of these be used as a predictor for, you know? You know, I think that that's something that, I think that um, other people, I think the people up in Seattle have been doing that. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're gonna be sequencing, if you're gonna be sequencing lots of stuff, you might as well look at what co-infections there are. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that what they found, of course, in the early days was that other, other infections went way down once we started to, to do all the social distancing, mask wearing it, you know, normal colds, flus, all kinds of stuff went way, way down. Mm -hmm. So, a, as you would expect. Interesting. Yeah. I hope that's still true. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll know soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although, you know, it's interesting. I don't know if you guys have noticed the back east already, but 
I've started noticing more cases of people just with regular colds and hmm. stuff. And, you know, they get tested. And it's got nothing to do with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And you wonder, how the hell do they get those since they're, <laughs> you know, they're supposed to be <laughs> pretty, pretty much isolating? This includes people in the lab who, you know, really know how to do this, right? So I'm a little puzzled. I'm almost thinking maybe that's it's the contact surface issues, which, you know, because I, I can't imagine it's the aerosols because everybody's like distancing and doing all that other stuff. Sure. But, you know, if you go outside and you're not wearing gloves, you're, you're touching stuff. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Teach, this was so fascinating. Um, and very, very inspiring. Um, yeah, th thank you so much for your time. Uh, John, can we get the closing slide up, please? Yeah, so um, please join us uh, next week at our on our normally scheduled day, Tuesday, um, noon Eastern time, and we'll have Ben Tenover, an amazing virologist from Mount Sinai. Um, so yeah, see everyone next week and teach. Thank you again so much. Hey, Did thanks you, a lot. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yep. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Be safe.